of liberty, of justice. This is the greatest nation on earth. Fight for the last best hope on earth. America is our home. America is, a gift is our home. Get to live in that the is a States. gift we get to live in America. historians believe that the average life cycle of a civilization is roughly 250 years. The United States just this past summer celebrated our 245th birthday. What that means is that this great nation has less than five years to make a very crucial choice. Are we going to dissolve at the hands of authoritarian progressivism and woke corporatism? Or are we going to rise up, stand for freedom, and pursue the liberties that have made this nation so special in the first place? We at Public Square are choosing freedom. We believe in a bright future for our nation, but we'll only get there if we pursue innovation and creativity as we push back against the tyranny of big tech and progressive corporations. Public Square is an app that provides local connection to those who have felt silenced. And we do this through interactive, safe, and sensor-free groups. And we provide a digital marketplace that displays all of the freedom-loving businesses in your local community so that you can ensure you're spending your hard-earned money in alignment with your values for all of life's purchases. We believe that freedom gets brought into the mainstream when we can provide a social platform for people in local communities to safely and securely live out their values and public square is that platform if you're looking for new friends that share your values or simply a cup of coffee at a cafe that hasn't gone woke you'll love the public square platform to join the national movement of thriving local communities download the public sq app today to get started
the community. So many people have been so kind and amazing to us and we appreciate every one of you. We'd like to thank UNMPD and New Mexico State Police for being here and for keeping us safe, and not only today, but for putting their lives on the line for us every single day. I could not continue without thanking um, a few instrumental people to our chapter. Firstly, the TPUSA staff for being here. You all have been there for us this week and every other week. You've been so supportive of our chapter here and helped us grow into what we are today, and we couldn't do it without you. And most of all, thank you to Turning Point USA for supporting our chapter and giving us the resources and training to pull off an event of all sizes. If you're interested in starting a chapter, please check out turning, the Turning Point USA table right outside or visit tpusa.com slash get involved. We would love to help you get plugged in. Finally, we encourage you all to attend America Fest the, this December in Phoenix, Arizona. This is the biggest conservative event and you won't want to miss it. Thank you all for joining us. We'll get started in a moment. We are here to celebrate the greatest nation ever to exist in the history of the world. You, as a human being, have dignity. That you have a right to speech, that you have a right to organize, that you have a right to start a family. They are the invaders. We are Americans, and we are going to win. To the stage, Shirley Kirk. We are here to celebrate the greatest nation ever to exist in the history of the world. You, as a human being, have dignity. That you have a right to speech, that you have a right to organize, that you have a right to start a family. They are the invaders. We are Americans. And we are going to win. Now, welcome to the stage, Charlie Kirk. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, we did it. I want to just, uh, geez, we just said hello out there. That was interesting. Uh, thank you guys for, for being here tonight. And um, my goodness, I want to thank our Turning Point USA chapter here. Give it up for them. I mean, to have to endure all that and go through it, it's, uh, it's really special. So it really, it really tell, it answers the question. You know, someone asked me the other day, they said, Charlie, how do you know if you're on the right side or the wrong side? And, I mean, you could just see outside. I mean, it's pretty self-evident, right? Not exactly happy people. And if, if you have to spend your evenings trying to prevent other people from going to an optional event on a college campus, you're probably not on the right side of history. In fact, you're probably so incredibly fragile about your own beliefs, your own life, that you try to use force to try to shut up the other side. And, by the way, give it up for the police. They're doing a very good job out there. They really are. And it, that's, a, that's, a, that's a difficult position that they're in, and it's not, not easy at all. So I, I could talk for a little bit here. I do want to take some questions. But one, the main reason we're here uh, so close to Christmas break is I think it's very important that we draw a line in the sand and do not allow the bad guys to shut us up. I think it's a very important thing. And free speech is fundamental to a free society. And we had two other events this semester, both of which were canceled. And I, I looked at it from afar and I said, if I have anything to say about it, we're not going to put up with that at Turning Point USA, no matter what it takes. That if you are going to use force and mass tactics and all that nonsense to try to say that we're going to intimidate you and we're going to try to prevent you from organizing, then we're only going to want to do that even more. And let that be a lesson. Let it be a lesson that you cannot allow bullies to win. And look, I mean, we're, we're in New Mexico. I, 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 it's a land of enchantment, which I always find to be very interesting. Uh, and fitting, by the way, very fitting. Uh, happy to talk about that as well. I, I understand conservatives are outnumbered. Fine, okay, we can have a conversation about that. But that doesn't mean you should allow the bad guys to win at all. And this event tonight shows the bad guys that we're going to keep on organizing. That you might, you know, prevent people from walking into an event and you might smear or slander or dox or say horrible names. Who's Eric or Erica, by the way? Who? You are a very special person, I have to tell you. They're chanting terrible things about you, and 
I think you're great. I really do. I, 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 we, we met at the church, by the way. I remember that. And I said I like the name Erica. And the bad guys get weaker when we don't give up. Remember that. And look, free speech is messy at times. Free speech is necessary, though, because there's only two ways that human beings can govern themselves, through speech or force. So you can have a society designed around having reasonable disagreement, which I hope we have tonight, and we'll invite that. Or you can have a society like that, where the louder voice or the person who's willing to use force wins. And honestly, I want you to think about this. How is it any different than what those people want to have happen, thankfully they didn't win, and what's going on in communist China right now? It's exactly the same thing. We don't like your opinion, so we're going to try to use force to shut you up. And thankfully, we still have some semblance of a First Amendment here. I also want to thank University of New Mexico. I'm sure I gave them a headache by showing up here. And so thank you for allowing us on campus. I mean, I, I mean that. But, and I, I want to just make this very clear. The reason I'm here is for a principled reason which is if you lose speech, you lose your entire civilization, period. It's the only thing that separates us from the beasts. And you could totally disagree with everything that I have to say, and you might think whatever one-liner you want to think. But to want to use force to shut that person up is a very dangerous road to get on. So I had a whole speech prepared. I don't have to give it. Uh, I was going to talk about why secularism sucks, um, which is a whole, yeah. I, I, I could give that speech if you want. One of the reasons, and by the way, I'm not here to, you know, overly religialize the conversation, but we, could, we can have a conversation about that. However, my goodness, look at the fruit of secularism. People start to make up all these fake and weird religions to replace a Judeo-Christian worldview. How many people out there do you think are religious? Very few, I would imagine. How many people out there that are screaming the worst things you could scream and trying to dox other people, how many of them do you think attend a religious service on a regular basis? I would just probably imagine, because this, this is their religious ceremony, is to go out and think that they're fighting what they call white supremacy, which they can never define and they can never articulate. And to them, it gives them meaning. And... Viktor Frankl wrote a wonderful book, book Man's Search for Meaning. It's a great, it's a game changer of a book. It's a life changing book. It really is. Where he was a Holocaust survivor and he went through the process of trying to ask the question, what is life all about? And he came to a conclusion that life is beautiful and there is good in the world and it's worth protecting and preserving. This is a Holocaust survivor, right? This is a guy that has every reason to give up and believe that life is nothing but a tragedy. And he did, however, argue many times that be very afraid of what can replace a belief in God. G.K. Chesterton, who's one of the great authors of the 20th century, he said, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They'll believe in anything. And that's much more of a threat to society than nothing. And the people outside, they'll believe in anything. They'll just get a sign, they start screaming. It might make them feel good. It might be therapeutic and cathartic. I, I wish I could have a conversation with some of them instead of them screaming at the top of their lungs. That's fine. But a society that is well, that is based in things that are eternally beautiful, starting a family, having a relationship, believing in the divine, understanding the good, the true, and the beautiful, probably doesn't act like that. And honestly, I looked at them tonight, and I mean this with all sincerity. Those people are hurting. They are. That, that you are a very miserable person to do that. And I can make fun of it, and that's and we probably should in some sense. But in another sense, it's actually at a more fundamental level you say, you know what? They have a very big void to fill. I think God can only fill that void, by the way. I really believe that. And you might, you might see it differently, and we can have a discourse or dialogue about that. But in society, the outgrowths of hyper-secularism gets you into a place where, where all of a sudden man is searching for meaning in places they shouldn't be, protesting someone because they want to talk about free speech on campus. Like, let's, let's, let's maybe encourage them to go find a significant other, get in a relationship, maybe believe in God, go to church, get a job, any job, and wake up probably before noon. That would probably get your life some meaning. No, seriously. Not just acting as if you are on some sort of individual pioneer crusade to extinguish, extinguish the world of evil. You see, many of them will go home tonight and they'll feel good for a short period of time because they think they're fighting evil. That's what's so fascinating, is that if you sat down every single one of those, you know, protesters, it's the same thing that happened at the Tommy Lahren event and the pro-life event, and they think they're doing good. And that's why intentions mean nothing. You know, it matters what you do. 
because every single one of them think they're on some sort of wonderful crusade that history will judge them nicely. Here's just a good rule for life. If you're trying to shut somebody up, you're probably not on the right side of history, just usually, typically. In fact, come prove the person wrong, which is what's hilarious, is because we give the mic to the people to disagree with us at events like this. No, no, no. See, that's, that right there would only be, in their opinion, justifying the white supremacy. You see, and I hate to overly generalize, or, but many of the people outside, they have a belief that speech, dialogue through reason, only perpetuates a white supremacist, westo, heteronormative, phallo-logocentric construct. Basically, they believe that speech is one of the reasons why we're in this mess. Now, that's the opposite. Speech is actually the reason why we're not tearing each other apart. You want to go live in communist China? Go look what it is right now. That's what happens when you don't have speech. It's not an exaggeration. It's a very real thing. There will be tens of thousands of people spent, sent to the equivalent of gulags. Look at Iran, which, by the way, very pleased we beat them in soccer. It's a very good thing. And by the way, it's soccer, not football, OK? A young lady was basically was sent to a prison and was beat to death because she wasn't wearing the hijab correctly. Now that's, I will fully acknowledge, that is religious extremism. But do you ever hear about secular extremism? We only act as if the religious could be extreme. Of course the religious could be extreme. The secular can also be very extreme. In fact, we're living through the greatest threat to our liberty is secular extremism, not religious extremism. They want to tell you, well, it's Christian nationalism. They can never define it. You know what? Actually, fear, people should fear a lot more than that. Very empty people that own nothing and that are not married. They're a very big threat to our civilization. And I, I hope that they will find something that will anchor them in goodness and truth and beauty. And only speech can do that. So we are the speaking beings, as Aristotle would say. And spe the speaking beings means we can reason. It means that we are able to communicate, as I said, say, have dialogue. I believe that the Bible answers the question perfectly, that we're made in the image of God, and God spoke things into existence. Speech is our ability to bring nothing into something, as the Bible would say, ex nihilo, to create something new. When you do not have speech in a society of which we live in, which is very diverse and religiously, linguistically, and culturally, the, co the country starts to fall apart. That's it. It's a binary choice. Very few things in life, by the way, are binary. You can either be governed by force or by speech. The founding fathers made a decision to build a country built on speech. And that means you might have to hear something you don't like. But you know what's so hilarious about what we're doing tonight is that it's optional. It's voluntary. No one was forced to be here except the Turning Point staff. And they did a great job, by the way. Thank you. You are forced to be here. That's right. But if you don't like it, then don't show up. And you want to know why I know Turning Point USA is making a very big difference, why I know Turning Point USA is moving the dial, why I know Turning Point USA is a big threat to the left? Because why would an hour and 10 minute lecture warrant an 150 person protest if what we had to say wasn't resonating? That's how I know what we're doing is working. Well, uh, what I know what we are doing is working, what all of you in our chapter are doing and all of our high school chapters and everyone involved in Turning Point USA is making a difference because you don't have that many people mobilize if all of a sudden what our ideas are somehow a threat to authoritarianism and tyranny. So I could keep talking about that. I have other reasons why secularism is a very big issue in our country. I'm not here to profess anything specific. I'm a Christian, happy to talk about that. Highly recommend it. It's great. It's life changing. Um, and uh, also you get eternal life out of it. So it's actually a pretty good deal. Um, however, you could believe whatever you want to believe. We could talk about all of that. But most importantly, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Those of you that got spit on and harassed and doxxed, it takes courage. And I never thought I'd have to say that. I hope everyone watching online recognizes and understands that what I just did is I just complimented attendees of an event for showing up. Think about that. Yeah. I'm, I'm complimenting you for your courage, which, by the way, is very warranted what you just had to go through. About 50 people turned away and walked away. Like, I don't want to deal with this. Things have got to change. And how do you change them? You don't fold and you have more events like this. Yeah. And let it be known to those people out there that I hope that they, they have some sort of uh, revival in their life. They lost tonight. Mm -hmm. And that's a big deal. All right, let's do some questions, guys. Thank you. And then, Richard, you want to line up? And uh, the way it works is question, not a speech. If you uh, disagree, you go to the front of the line, and um, we love disagreement. In fact, that's what this event is all about. We invite it. And um, also, if, uh, if you find a question objectionable or if you find a question disagreeable, please do not mock, interrupt, or boo the person you're talking to. 
Uh, it is very important that different ideas are given a platform, uh, especially at conservative events, and that we can have a dialogue and a discussion from there. And if you disagree, go to the line, and we'll uh, go from there, and I'll stay till they kick me off. Okay, we'll start with the first question. Okay. I remember you from Steve Smotherman's church. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. I'm back again. <laughs> So, um, in your opinion, what's the first step to improve crime and homelessness in Albuquerque? Yeah, well, uh, crime is uh, not, we don't have to overthink that. Uh, you have to arrest more bad guys and keep them in jail longer. I don't think that has to be overly, you know, considered. I hate to say it, but this is no longer a safe city. No. Uh, I've, been coming to, I've been coming to New Mexico for at least the last seven or eight years I love this place. There's some phenomenal people here. Notice I say some. Not everyone here is phenomenal. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Some, every state has good people. I think I have to say the fighters in New Mexico give me a lot of hope. I, I, the, it's, the, the chapters, the people, it's, what you guys do is incredible. So you, so, but New Mexico and Albuquerque, have become a prof, it's become a profoundly dangerous city, and the statistics show that. And just being here, I mean, I, I talked to, last time I was here a couple weeks ago, I spoke at Steve Smotherman's church. I just started asking questions. I said, do you feel safe in your own city? And when people say, no, I don't, you've got a very serious problem. And I don't know what the breaking point of that is going to be. Obviously, there you know, needs to be, I think, some political changes there. That didn't happen. So um, the best way to protect yourself is have a firearm on you at all times when you are in Albuquerque. I wish I didn't have to say that, but that's true. And then finally, I hope that at some point a return to sanity is restored and the bad guys could be locked up for longer because on you know this is this you start to see this crime hurts all people but it's going to hurt working class lower middle class people the most is they don't have access to bodyguards or gated communities as much and so it will end up safety will end up becoming a luxury of the elite which is exactly where they're leading us to that's where how brazil is that's how a lot of these third world countries are so as far as homelessness uh, has to be done with compassion and justice mixed together. I do not believe the street is your home, period. Uh, I believe that you should be brought to a shelter with a meal, with compassion, uh, but you should not be able to just post up on the side of the street, uh, which is unsanitary. It's bad for the person. It's bad for everybody. It becomes a place, especially for homeless women, where they get raped regularly. It shouldn't be tolerated or allowed. Open air vagrancy, I believe, is depressing the non-homeless person, all of us, and it's also, it's, it's an insult to actually the homeless person. I think they could do better than that. And I don't think that we should all of a sudden platform, in my opinion, the incredible increase in people that are truly suffering and say, well, you know, the street is their home. I, 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 I reject the premise. I think it's bad for everybody involved. Thanks for your question. I appreciate it. Thank you again. Thanks. All righty. Um, so I don't know if you know, probably do but new mexico is the late-term abortion capital of yes, the country I, I, I do know and that. i believe of the world um and our governor has been promoting it and funding it and we've had so many abortion clinics just come into the state and move to the state over the past uh, just a couple months um so i was just curious what you would say is the most effective to combat abortion and our government our governor in that yeah. way yeah i mean in new mexico it's tough I mean, abortion should be outlawed, but that's a separate issue. Uh, that's not going to happen here. The opposite is happening here, unfortunately. I believe there's a spiritual component to this. I mean, it's how you could butcher a late-term baby is just beyond me. It's just unbelievable. So, look, you've got to get involved in the space of convincing people that there are resources available supporting the pregnancy crisis centers, uh, letting them know that, um, that they are loved and that that is a human being. And unfortunately, Albuquerque is now becoming kind of a destination point for abortion tourism across the country where people come here just to be able to have abortions. Life begins at conception. Uh, life is something that human life is worthy of pr preservation and protection, no matter how big you are and no matter where you are. So it doesn't matter if you're in the womb or outside of the womb. Human life is, needs to be protected. It's a long fight here in Albuquerque. But um, I really want to commend the churches and the nonprofits that are working very hard in this. Uh, and we have to try to contest and fight for a culture of life. We really do. Um, and the, I mean, how it ever got to be this way, I, I don't know, because there's so many great people here in New Mexico. Uh, and it's just so, at least in my personal opinion, in my experience, so wildly misrepresentative of the average person in this beautiful state. But so be it. And you got to fight it. And you have to try to expose it. Psalm 97.10 has a beautiful thing. It says, if you love God, you must hate evil. And there's a lot of evil to hate in New Mexico, i got to tell you. And the, it being the late-term abortion capital 
of America, if not the world. I mean, the abortion policies here in New Mexico are more extreme than almost all of Western Europe. It's more extreme than almost every country. It's one of the worst on the planet. You got to keep fighting it. God bless you. Thank you. So I just had a question regarding the general term of racism. Why is it marginalized? to bully people, more implicative, not of their behaviors or anything, but more to be informally intolerant of whatever they have to say? Yeah, so that's a good question. So unfortunately, when we talk about racism, the left is talking about something completely different. So they basically want to strip you of your identity as an individual. It's one of the big goals of the collectivist left. I keep talking about China because it's in the news, but Ch the Chinese Communist Party completely agrees with this. No individual, there, therefore no individual rights, no right to speech, no right to privacy. You're a member of a collective, right? Now, there is some truth that we're a member of groups, right? We're a member of a country, but we're first individuals. And this country recognized that first and foremost. So if I were to venture a guess, when you and I talk about racism, we talk about XYZ person being racist to you know, another person. That's wrong. That's terrible. When the left talks about racism, they're talking about power. They're saying the group of white people, by their existence, by their structures, by their success, is being, is exploiting another group just because they exist. And they do not want to look at people as individuals. They want to collectivize the entire society. Needless to say, this is wrong, it's immoral, it's evil, and the byproduct of it is an incredibly, let's say, dangerous society to live in, where if you tell a young person you're nothing more than a member of a group, not an individual, you're creating an actual racist society, which is exactly where they're leading us. And it's so disempowering, isn't it? If you tell a person on both ways, you're white and you're evil just because of the color of your skin, and then you tell a black person you're oppressed just because of the color of your skin. What you've just done is told somebody that they have irredeemable sin, and you told the other person that they have a mountain that they can never climb. That's disempowering for both people. What you have done is you have created basically a you are guilty and you can never become clean, which is like the, the new way. It's like you, are, you will be racist for the rest of time and you must continually atone for it and you're never going to reach it, despite the premise itself being completely and totally flawed. And so, look, the constant incantation of everything being racist has a strategy. Critical race theory, best summarized, is call everything racist until I control it. That's what CRT is. Thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks. And if you disagree, feel free to cut in line, guys. Hey there, Charlie. Uh, I just want to preface this by I, uh, I, I don't consider myself conservative nor liberal. I don't like those terms. I think that they're silly, they're stupid, and it causes for more division in our country. That being said, how would you combat the division that's happening in our country. I mean, it's, it's extreme. I mean, it's insane. Uh, and and I, I, I think that there's something that we need to do besides just liberal and, and fucking conservative. You know, that's, that's way too, that's, it's, it's just splits it in two. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think that the country is divided, not necessarily through liberal and conservative, more through the decent and the indecent, right now at least. And I think you would agree it wouldn't be characteristic for conservatives to act like the people outside, right? So, and there's, there's difference between liberals and leftists. I think you could probably agree, right? I think that's probably fair. Look, I think part of how you bridge the divide is what we try to do at Turning Point USA. I am 100% conservative and I own it. But if you disagree, tell me why. And maybe we're going to hate each other less afterwards, right? And I think that's actually, I believe speech heals a lot of sins. I really do. And I think what you saw outside, that's going to get you closer to conflict than anything else. Screaming at people, having awfully, you know, expletive-filled signs, preventing people from entering. They always say, you know, oh, yeah, the, the country is divided. Yes, I mean, I think we're divided on certain issues. However, I actually think the vast majority of Americans find what happened out there despicable. I really do. I think that most Americans don't think that is acceptable and okay. We have to talk to each other more. I think you would agree with that, right? No, I totally agree. I, I actually, I really appreciate that you said that uh, 
most people wouldn't agree with, with, with what's happening out there. I mean, even a lot of the liberal people I talk to, they would 100% agree that that is outrageous. It is silly and goofy yep. in all its ways. Um, I, I think it's best to look at people in, in a more positive light and, and not let the negativity be the, the, the biggest factor of, of our dislike towards a group of people. That's just silly. So, yeah. yeah, and you could have negativity, but then it's also how do you handle it, right? So there's thoughts and actions. You could have horrible thoughts about somebody, but then how are you going to handle it? How about show up to the event like an adult, sit through what somebody has to say, and then ask a question, yeah. right? That, you could have the thoughts, but then act like it's someone who actually wants to be part of a society, not the Lord of the Flies. Thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Okay, so you claim to be a Christian, correct? I am a Christian, yeah. Yes, I am as well. So I just want to know, as a conservative in a very political setting, as someone who's very, very open about your politics, obviously, that's why you're here, I would like to know how you balance allowing the Bible and your religion and what you believe influence your political beliefs instead of your political beliefs influencing your religion. Because I, as a Christian, see a lot of my Christian friends do this, and they are hyper-Republican and hyper-conservative before they are Christians instead of Christians before they are political. Okay. That, that's a fair question. I think it's okay either way, but my Christianity comes first. And I'll tell you why it's okay either way, because if you are a true, conser if you are a true Christian, then you are going to have a conservative disposition. For example, you're going to want to protect children from suffering. You're going to want to protect the institution of marriage. You're going to want to protect distinctions, which is a religious Christian belief. For example, the Bible, one of the main themes of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is distinctions, right? Man and woman, good and evil, right and wrong. And the modern leftist movement is trying to destroy distinctions in a lot of different ways. But my Christianity is the basis of my belief. So, for example, as a Christian, I believe that people are not inherently good. Therefore, I think we should organize government appropriately. Meaning, since people are not good, you better make it really hard to get power. The founding fathers agreed with me, by the way. Okay? I also believe that there is a God, and I am not him. Yeah, yeah so, sorry, please interject. So, yeah. follow-up question with that. I am a Christian, and I 100% agree with you. I just also would like to know, do you truly fear God? Yeah, yeah, of course I do, yes. Well, is, is that not clear, or? No, just curious. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I, I do fear I, God. I also love God, too. Yeah. Um, but yes, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, as it says multiple times in the scriptures. But yes, I do. And yeah. I also believe that, that when you lie, you cheat, you steal, or you are in defiance of the, te the Ten Commandments, you know, you're, you're actively rebelling against a God who loves you. Thank goodness we have Jesus, because I can't keep up with all the rules. Grace. I 100% agree. Right. Just curious, because I know that a lot of um, politicians that claim to be Christians, and obviously the, the fruit is in your life, there's evidence that you are truly a Christian and that you fear God, when asked that question, a lot of them back down and they go, oh, I don't know. So I, I hope my actions throughout the course of my career show that more than my words, because words are cheap, actions are earned. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless you. Thank you. Hi, Car uh, Hi Charlie. Let's Not a you. congressman. Okay. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Keep going. There will always be a portion of the population that won't believe in God, and you claim that number is growing. How do you reach out to them without using religious messaging? It's a good question. And yes, that number is growing. I think you would, it's just a fact, right? So you, it's okay not to believe in God in, the, in a political context, but you have to acknowledge the consequences of what happens when a society doesn't believe in God. I think that's a very important thing that if you remove God from the equation, and Sam Harris did his best, but I think failed and fell short, in my opinion, to address this in his book, The Moral Landscape, exquisitely written, but still I think the argument comes short, is right and wrong becomes merely an opinion if you remove God. That's a fact. It, 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 there, there is no other way that you can get to objective morality if you remove a belief in God. Okay. However, if you, someone is an atheist or you're secular or you're agnostic and you're here tonight, welcome. I mean that. I'm glad you're here. You could still 
start, you could still believe in the fruits of the natural law. So, for example, you could be secular and still believe that children and their innocence should be protected. Okay, great. That means that you believe in the natural law. We're saying the same thing. I believe there's a natural law giver and a designer of that natural law it didn't just kind of fall randomly into the sky. However, if you, and I'll, I say this a lot. For example, one of my very um, special friends is Dr. James Lindsay, who's a secular uh, agnostic. He's spectacular. I think he's done more good for liberty than most Christians have the last couple of years because he fights against CRT, fights for religious liberty, and fights for individual agency against this kind of wokeism mob stuff. God bless him. He laughs when I say God bless him, right? So I'm happy to partner, align, work with people that are non-religious. However, I will not waver from where does that morality come from? I mean, it, it does come from a belief in a higher power. In fact, our entire civilization is an outgrowth of that. Do you have a follow-up thought? No, that's it. Thank All you. All right. Thanks for being here tonight. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to bring this up, but, you know, I'm part Apache. I'm part Mexican. And, yeah. you know, I've been thinking, shouldn't America, white America, acknowledge, I guess, some of the wrongs that the white colonists have imposed on native tribes, and if so, how can we correct that? Okay, um, I think that's probably been done, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, is there not a federal bureau of, they call it Indian Affairs, but Native American Affairs, right? They do a very poor job at what they're doing. Oh, I, yeah. I agree with that. I mean, anything government touches is awful, but the whole premise, <laughs> the premise of the, of, the, of the program was quasi-apologetic reparations, wasn't it? Now, what I will say, though, is the question I'll take a little bit of an objection to. Let me tell you why. I'm white, and I don't owe anybody an apology for something I did not individually do. I, I had nothing to do with the exploitation of Native Americans. I think it was wrong. I think it's wrong what Andrew Jackson did. Abraham Lincoln was no hero either. But I'm my own individual, my own person. So I, I'm not going to apologize on behalf of a skin group nor should I think anyone should be compelled to do the same. Now, as far as how to empower indigenous people and Native American tribes, we've done everything wrong. Native American communities are the worst example of socialist failed experiments, in my personal opinion. High government dependency, widespread corruption, abuse by elders. If you want to look at where the government has messed up terribly, it's on Native American reservations. And so I'm not going to apologize for something I didn't do, but I will recognize that there has been about a 30 to 40 year mistreatment, mostly designed by big government liberals, by the way, coming in with a lot of promises to these reservations. And unfortunately, the statistics show that most Native American reservations are the most alcohol addicted, drug addicted, suicidal, and hopeless square miles in America. Any thoughts? No, thank you very much. Thanks for being here, appreciate it. How's it going? Um, so I guess the, the question that I had in mind was, um, as it relates to free speech, I guess what do you have as potentially its limits? Yeah, that's a good question. We're nowhere near that. So I think reasonable protections for children in particular. Um, I, I am, it will appear that I'm contradicting myself, but I'm not. I don't think pornography is speech. I don't. I actually think it should be harder to consume pornography in America. I think it's one of the great pollutants of our society that has damaged so many young people and young men in particular and increasingly young women. I'm not saying you should make it illegal, but I think, actually I would think you should make it illegal, but I think that <laughs> if, 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 that's not realistic, right? I think you could actually take the European model where, okay, you have to put a credit card and you have to put some sort of age verification system. But we're, 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 that, that's, that's always brought up, right? People say, well, what about pornography? I, look, I, I just I don't think that is anywhere near where the founding fathers were intending what freedom of speech should be for. I don't think when they were writing the First Amendment, they were saying, you know why we rebelled against the British? So people could look at two dudes, you know. Like, no, I, don't, I don't think that's, I, I, don't, I don't think that was the moral premise of separation. I, I, I don't. However, I have to say our limits should be very, very carefully enforced. 
I think, I, I mean, Lord Acton had one of the great quotes. No, I'm sorry, it wasn't Lord Acton. It was um, William Blackstone who said it's better for nine, um, nine guilty people to walk than an innocent person to go to jail, right, if out of ten people, right? That's his famous quote. I think the same is for speech. I think it's better for nine cases to go uncensored than for one wrong case to go censored. So I draw the line with children unapologetically. Um, I had a very bizarre question the other day. Someone said, well, Charlie, you're for free speech. Why don't you stand for public nudity? And I said, that, that, that's, that's very interesting. We're really expanding speech, aren't we? And the answer is very, it, it, again, it, it was actually fascinating. If you go look at um, the San Francisco City Council meeting when they were debating public nudity, at first it failed to, to pass. And you know what the objection was for the secularists in San Francisco? Sanitation. They said it wasn't, it wasn't clean. Public nudity wasn't clean. So eventually they passed it because they had no moral objection. No, you owe it to the children of your society not to see naked people around because the innocence of children needs to be protected. So, you know, it's very interesting. We constantly fight against air pollution. We hate air pollution, right, environmentalists. We, can, we fight against water pollution. Do we ever fight against soul pollution? Like maybe the thing that the innocent person shouldn't be seeing that made them innocent no longer? So I think you have to use prudence. But again, my line is usually... It's better to allow a questionable case to speak than not. That would usually be my rule. Okay. Just a quick follow-up on that one. Because um, as it relates to speech, the idea of speech, I think in at least the Aristotelian sense, is that it's supposed to be to produce truth. That's uh, correct. Or, or to speak the to truth. To pursue it. Yeah, that's um, right. And, the logos. Sure. And I guess with that, at what point do we limit uh, the use of speech for non-truth? I guess... Because at some point, if that does not occur, it appears that the truth is a matter of public opinion. Yeah, are you, are you Catholic? Yes. I could tell. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, no one mentions Aristotle unless they're Catholic. But that's, it, I, I mean that as a compliment. I do. I, I'm a big Aristotle guy. The question is who decides. You're right. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, in the, current, in the current regime, we have to yield to neutrality. It's just the way it is. The only hope we have to be able to speak truth is the demand for neutrality. Okay? You, do, you have to. Now, what's hilarious, though, is they don't want neutrality, they being the collectivists and the authoritarians and the dictators. And so they will say, well, you, so a classically liberal answer to that, an enlightenment answer to that, a non-Aristotelian answer, which would be more Spinozan, right, would say, but how do you know what truth is so you just let everybody speak, right? I'm actually okay with that right now. Because at least I get to speak. Okay? The problem is that they want it the other way. They want to say, no, no, only we get to speak and you don't. So I just think right now it's a wildly unrealistic question, respectfully, right? But I will say the mechanics of speech, when properly employed throughout periods of time, does approximate you closer to the logos, to the truth. It does. Especially if you allow people that hopefully are very serious about their study to be able to express their opinions freely. So, but I, I'd happy to explore that more with you. Thank you. God bless you. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I was curious, uh, how would you go about fighting Marxist indoctrination on college campuses and high schools? Just more of this. Turning Point USA has got to grow. I got to tell you, we got to keep on fighting, do more videos, do more content. I, I think that, look, as far as when it goes to, you know, Marxist indoctrination, which is a very, very real thing, and it's a very big threat to our society, the, I, I'm a big believer in, obviously, truth and spreading it. And actually, a piggyback on the previous question, because I could connect the two. This is where education, I think, gets blurred a little bit, okay? So some people will misunderstand when I talk about free speech and freedom of dialogue, and they say, well, Charlie, then why don't you want to teach a fourth grader critical race theory? right? Because freedom of speech. An educational setting is not the public square. It's not, especially for third, fourth, and fifth graders. You're there to teach them something. You're there to instruct them something. You're not there to hear about their opinions. I couldn't care less what a third grader has to tell me about politics. I couldn't care less. And you shouldn't either, okay? Like, they got to do some work, and they got to read something that they didn't write that was written by somebody smart and wise, and then I could hear about it. Maybe when they're in high school, I all hear about it. Third, fourth, it's like, oh, well, you know, the fourth graders really understand climate change. They don't understand anything, 
okay? They need to be taught something. And so when it comes to the instruction of Marxism, I think we have to be very clear what is the purpose of education. The classical interpretation of education is to lead forth. It's what the Latin word literally means, to lead forth towards enlightenment or to truth. If you're familiar with Plato's allegory of the cave, the word education actually means that story, to bring you from assimilation into enlightenment. That's what education is supposed to be. But also it means that you're supposed to have a specific destination in mind, which the Greeks would call the teleological or telos, the direction. It's not supposed to just be a hodgepodge where we throw a bunch of kids, things at kids and they get to decide. And so then you say, okay, Charlie, then what do you, what, what do you decide? What, what, what do you want to do? I want kids to understand good, true, and beautiful things. I want them to know the best society has to offer. That's what I want them to know. I want them to know why is it that this civilization has been as successful as it has been. That's a good thing for society. I don't need them to hear about the garbage or the propaganda about why this country is awful and evil and misogynistic and colonialistic. It's not what education is for. It's not. Someone would disagree. Like, that's exactly what education is for. Okay. Well, only one side can win, I suppose. And they say, well, I want to hear both sides. And I always hear they say, like, so you have a fourth grader, right? Limited attention span, increasingly so because of TikTok. You only get so much. TikTok is garbage, by the way. It's a terrible thing. You only get so much attention with a kid, right? You only get so much time to talk to them. So let me get this straight. Do we talk about both sides of the flat earth theory? Yeah, so you say, okay, um, let's teach the kids equal time that the earth is flat and equal time that the earth is circular. Okay, or spherical. I'm sorry, spherical, not circular. Do we do equal time? No, of course not. It's silly. We know that. Do we do bloodletting? Seminars like, you know, there's an interesting theory that used to exist where you could get rid of your viruses by slitting your wrists. It's, it's rubbish. You don't teach things that aren't true. You have to know what is true before you ever step foot into an education setting. And if you're afraid to say that there's objective truth, you should not be a teacher. You should be a student. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so... As I was walking through the walk of shame, I think that's what they called it, uh, I, started, um, <laughs> I started getting like, called from them, like being yelled at, and then I eventually I got called brown, yep. so I don't know what that means, because they were saying how, they were, like, white or how we are white supremacists, then they called me brown, and I, and I was on the wrong side, that's what they were saying. So then it started um, making me think about it, because then you also mentioned it in your opening remarks, how they're always attacking us, but they're never doing this. Right, and so I wanted to like kind of know your your thoughts on that. On why is it that they don't have stuff like this? How they're always focused on just trying not to trying not to let us do this, but they're not focused on doing it themselves. Thank you for being here. That, that that's a wonderful question. They don't believe speech is a value. Their viewpoint is that speech is white supremacy. If you read. Jacques Derrida, who is one of the most um, cited, yeah, thank you, that's, that's well said. He's one of the most cited and influential postmodernist thinkers of the last 50 or 60 years. He had a term that I kind of blitzed through, okay, where he said the West is fallow, logo centric. Fallow, meaning the phallus, it is dominated by men. Logo, logos in the Greek, truth, speech, reason, rational dialogue, all those things are replacement terms, centric. And he said, this is the problem with the West. Men talking, that's the center. And so, therefore, in the postmodernist view, and you can read One Dimensional Man by Herbert Marcuse, you could read Intro to Critical Theory by all of the, um, by it, Derek Bell didn't write Intro to Critical Theory, but anyway, they talk about how speech is not something that we should embrace, that it's dangerous, that it's a trick, that actually all of you are being fooled by being here, that the fact we're talking is actually Charlie being a white supremacist and hoodwinking you to believe that everything should remain the same. I find that to be laughable and objectionable. That's a growing view in America. That's what used to run Twitter. doesn't anymore, thanks to Elon Musk. Elon Musk believes in speech. Praise God he does. It's a big deal because every single totalitarian regime has two things in common. 
They must shut up people who disagree with them, always. From Lenin to Mao to right now in the CCP to what Twitter used to be. And number two, they think they're doing good. If you interviewed Hitler a year before he committed suicide and you said, do you think you're doing good? He's convinced he was doing the right thing. Everyone out there thinks they're doing the right thing. You know how you find out? You got to defend your position against someone who disagrees. Speech. If you don't talk, you get radical very quickly. And that's what's happening in our country. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And thanks for fighting through that. So you talked a lot tonight about things that are good and true and beautiful. And so this brought to mind uh, one of my favorite questions, which is, what does it mean to be good? It's a, it's a great question. What does it mean to be good? I would say, first and foremost, to glorify God, to protect what is eternal, that which always lasts. We could spend two hours talking about, two, two semesters talking about what is good. I think Aristotle got it closest to right. The first line of Aristotle's ethics is that every art, every inquiry, every action points towards some good. So what Aristotle was saying is the same thing I've been saying, which is if you take out the kind of mentally insane, okay, outside of the equation, okay, every person, including a bad person, thinks they are doing good. Therefore, the most important question that you can wrestle with a young person is what is good? That's the most important thing because... Right now, you have an entire movement on the left that is committed, they are doing good. And then you have an entire movement on the right that thinks they are doing good. Somebody has to be right. Somebody has to be wrong. Or they both could be wrong. But the point is that they're both convinced that their actions are leading towards a good. So what is the good? Best way I could say it in my own metaphysical view is to glorify God, to bring people closer to him, to conserve the best and the beautiful. And you might say, well, Charlie, give me an example of what is beautiful. Well, I could go through natural beauty. You're surrounded by it in New Mexico. I could go through the beauty of how incredible it is to create life. We just welcomed the daughter into, into, into the world. Very beautiful thing, by the way. <laughs> the good needs to be protected with courage. And one of the reasons why people say there's no good in the world, which is just not true, is the courage have allowed evil to overtake good far too often. So that's the best answer I could give to that. Thank you. Hey, Charlie, thanks for coming. It's, it's not God's will that any should perish, but come to repentance and have eternal life. Many Democrats are quick to label Bible believers as homophobic and transphobic if we don't tolerate or denounce it as sin. So how do we bridge the gap and share the truth with, with them? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, bridging the gap, I, I, can't, I can't really help with that, I'll be honest. Because, I mean, I, I say that because I say these things and I get protests, right? Look, I believe marriage is between one man and one woman. And I believe this trans thing is one of the most insidious and poisonous movements happening in America right now. And you might have your own personal opinions about this, but if you think that it's okay to teach an eight-year-old that you could change your gender or your sex, I think you're completely wrong. I think it's immoral to put an 11-year-old into surgery because they think that there's something they're not. The whole point of being a child is you're more fascinated with imagination than reality. That's what being a child is. You grow up, you say, well, you know, people say, grow up! You know what you say when you grow up? It means get back to reality is what it means. So, look, as far as bridging the gap, this is one of the reasons why the education system has done so much damage in our country, is you have, to, you have to stay true to the natural law. which And then this is why understanding the Bible is so important. And by the way, any of you can propose a better guide than the Bible. You're welcome to come up at any time and tell me what book you think is a better manual for humanity. I mean that. Come to the, I'm open to any other book, which is distinctions. Life makes sense when you have distinctions. It just does. The Bible is so clear about the need of separation and distinctions. The sep distinction of good and evil, man and woman, animal and human, which is a very big one, by the way. We don't talk enough about that. And this is one of the things that the, the radical animal activists are, are involved in. By the way, if I, asked, if I asked just by a show of hands, those of you that have you know, dogs that you care about, if your dog was drowning or a stranger was drowning, who would save your dog? Raise your hand. Okay, a couple hands. Who would save the stranger? Okay, it shouldn't even be close, okay? No offense, you should let your dog die because your heart is misleading you. The dog and the human are not on equal moral footing. 
You may love your dog, but your heart is misleading you. It talks about that all throughout the Bible. The human is made in the image of God. The dog is not made in the image of God. The human has a soul. The dog does not. Okay? I could go on. How do we com- convince them? You've got you to try your best in a short period of time to talk about the natural law. Good luck. It's not easy, right? I, I totally understand that my position is deeply unpopular in an uh, ever-secular society. Thank you. Appreciate it. Again, if you uh, disagree, feel free to, to hop on in. Go ahead. Hey. Uh, so I got my undergraduate degree in public health, and through my whole college cr- uh, experience, it seemed like one answer, like one opinion was being pushed. Um, outside of college, most of these public health organizations and departments, Department of Health organizations are putting all their money, time, effort, resources into what I would say are like the wrong places to put our resources. Like, for example, COVID is one example, shutting down schools, businesses for safety, but the public health organizations don't seem to, to care about like the effects of like their actions. Um, what are your thoughts on like how could we change um, our focus to like real important issues and like, I don't want the, the degree of public health to be seen as, like, this hopeless degree in the eyes of, like, conservatives and Christians. Um, like, for example, my aunt, like, a couple weeks ago apologized for uh, being the reason why I, like, went and got a degree in public health. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, well, first of all, I want to encourage you. We need good people in all fields. We do. And we need good people to make sure Anthony Fauci never happens again. So that's your job, okay, to make sure we never get Anthony Fauci again. I, I could go on at length about why the lockdowns were one of the worst decisions ever made. And it goes back to a theme of this speech, which is what is your morality? And our morality as a society was to sacrifice the young for the old. That's what it was. There is no other way to explain the closure of schools, period. We are going to make this generation miserable because we want the old to be able to be protected. It should be the other way around, to be perfectly honest. It should be the old trying to sacrifice their own livelihood for their children. Instead, now we have the most suicidal, alcohol-addicted, drug-addicted generation in history. As far as going to public health, we need you. We need you to fight for a restoration of science, not scientism. You know, they always say, you know, follow the science is what they commonly say. They never meant that. They meant follow the scientists they like. Scientism is completely different than a moral, a moral exploration into the natural world. There's two ways to think about science, the right way and the dangerous way. The right way is that we're going to look into the natural world, see what it has to offer, see what, how things work, explore it, educate ourselves on it, and appreciate it. And then if we, have to make a, if we have to make innovations or experiments in reaction to that, praise God. Scientism is we're going to change the natural world. Totally different. You might say, Charlie, give me an example. Okay. Medically mutilating a 14-year-old that is born a boy and wants to be a girl. That's trying to change the natural world. That is using the force of man over what I believe is God-created nature. And that shouldn't be done. But boy, do we need you in public health. And then I would, just, I would um, recommend that we have a much broader view of what is public health because what is happening with our nation's young people when it comes to psychiatric drugs and depression, it, it's, it's great. It, it's, it's, it is a greater damaging long-term effect than COVID ever could have been to this generation. And a lot of it was preventable. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, hello, Mr. Kirk. My name's Kaylee. Um, so you talked a lot about freedom of speech. Uh, how do you suggest we protect the freedom of speech? How are we supposed to do that? Yeah, that's a really important question. So this is where it gets a little bit tricky, right? So it's not just the freedom to have events like this. So let, let's kind of go into a constitutional moral question, right? Which is, okay, the, the really sad people out there, they have a right to protest. We all acknowledge that. You have a right to come to the event. I have a right to speak, right? So that what, what happens then when they prevent you from coming into the building, right? Do they have a right then to forcibly block the doorway? I say no. I say they don't. I say at that point they're using force to prohibit your ability to attend an event. So at some point you have to be willing to use force to then protect the ability to speak. Now, I actually think the, the, the deeper and the more um, consequential argument on speech is happening online. And I have to say, 
one of the most unexpected and courageous things I've seen is Elon Musk buying Twitter. It's, it's, it is bigger than any election, than anything I could put my head around. If Twitter legitimately gets liberated, which it looks like it is in real time, the left is going to have a very hard time continually pushing these fake narratives on us. Imagine a free and open Twitter when they told us that the virus came from a bat at, the, at a wet market. You got kicked off. Imagine a free and open Twitter when they said the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinformation. Imagine a free and open Twitter when they told us that ivermectin was horse paste. All of those stories got you kicked off of Twitter, every single one of them. A free and open Twitter will prevent the next big lie from ever happening. So that's a big deal. But I think the bigger threat is Apple and Google. I think that they have far too much power to police our speech via YouTube and also the App Store. I'm not... I'm not enthusiastic about using government power. If you would have asked the question six months ago, I was extremely pessimistic about the status of free speech. But Elon has changed the game. I got to tell you, he has, he has been an unexpected entrant, entry into this entire dynamic. Because I used to say, you know, we got to have Section 230 reform and do all these different things. I still believe that. But, man, him spending $44 billion to go purchase a company, to go restore Donald Trump's Twitter account, and let all these people back online and these prisoners of war from the meme wars, I mean, it is... So they are. They're POWs. God bless them. That's a big threat to the regime. I will say this. I hope Elon is ready for what they're about to do to him. I, I don't think Elon is naive. I don't. But I, this is a provocative thing to say. Who has more powerful enemies than Elon Musk right now? I can't think of anybody. Donald Trump, maybe. I got to tell you, I think Elon beats Trump for right now, though. I got to tell you. Because Elon is an active participant in making it harder for them to take over the world. That's what he's doing. Man, he's, uh, I wouldn't want, I, I think he's always one move ahead of everybody else. And um, I sure hope he knows what he's doing because what he's doing is liberating speech. So anyway, to answer your question, you should be able to speak freely and there should be laws that reflect that. And it's time I think some of those laws get to the public square. Thankfully, we're in a much better spot because of Elon. Appreciate the question. Yeah, actually, I have one more. Um, okay, really quick. Uh, so and we only have time for a couple more. How can we pray for you? Oh, thank you so much. Um, pray for endurance. Uh, we didn't stop at all post-election. Boy, that was a mess. Um, and so we're, we're running a pretty high clip right now. And uh, pray that Turning Point USA continues to flourish. But more importantly, pray for our students. They get persecuted every single day. It's uh, very, very important. Thank you for asking that. And pray for our family, too. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hi, um, I'm a sophomore at La Cueva High School and the co-president of our chapter. And so awesome. since we started the chapter, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, so why do you even care about politics? Because obviously I'm not old enough to vote yet. And so they ask why I even care, because they think that it doesn't affect my generation and people that are my age, even though it very clearly does. So how would you explain that? Well, it actually, paradoxically, affects you more than anybody else, actually. Uh, every decision actually affects the next generation even more than the current generation, from the debt, from the southern border, from the drug use. First of all, what you're doing is you're fighting cynicism, right? And, and you're not the first one to do that uh, in, in society. But I think you should challenge whoever says that is, well, then what do you care about? And they might say nothing, and that's a very common Gen Z answer, right? I care about nothing, and I'm proud of it. I want to tell everyone how I care about nothing on TikTok. It's weird. Like, okay, see, so like, my whole TikTok is I care about nothing. Now follow me, because I care about nothing. Okay, well, you obviously care about something. Um, anyway, it's like this weird, like, badge of honor. Like, I'm too cool, so I'm cynical type thing. Like, yeah, okay, pal, we've, we've seen it all before. Um, so you got to fight against the cynicism. And then I think you have to give an answer. Like, I love this country, and I'm old enough. I'm not old enough to vote, but I'm old enough to think. You should try doing that is what you should tell them. But be nice. You're in high school, so, you, you know. But... Honestly, I, I hope adults that are voting age draw inspiration from you because that you're, you're not even able to vote and you're fighting very hard and you're trying to build a better life. And that's what you should say. You should say, I want a better life. It's never too young to start to try to build a better life. There's not all of a sudden like a magical bell when you hit voting age. Like now I could start to care. No, that's not the way it works. You want a better world. 
And by the way, those very same people, I guarantee you, have like BLM stickers on their laptop. And like, yeah, okay, so you care about that, but you don't care about this, or they're really big into Greta Thunberg or whatever, right? And so God bless you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also from the La Cueva chapter, and recently I got in a debate with this girl at school, and she claimed that in the U.S. women have it harder making money, and I wanted to see your like, argument to disapprove that opinion. Yeah, so th thank you for the question. It's great. So it, it comes from a specific left-wing lie. I actually haven't talked about this in quite some time. Because first I just, I just want to – I think you should just ask him because it's just hilarious. Just ask him what is a woman. Okay, just like just you, 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 you just got to get that out of the way, right? Because you could either, you got to have it. You got to pick one, right? It's either the womanhood is not a thing, or women are less than men. Like you got to. This is like the inherent civil war that I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting between feminism and the alphabet mafia. Like I just can't wait. Like please go to war eventually because they're inherently at odds with each other, right? Which is like womanhood is amazing. We're under attack. There is no such thing as a woman. Anyone could be a woman. There's only one answer to that. Um, so in, some, in a weird way, I actually totally agree with the feminists. Like, womanhood is a very real thing. The women are real, um, and there are differences between men and women. Okay, to your question, though. Okay, so Gloria Steinem feminism would argue that women are oppressed, and they're oppressed in the workplace. It's part of this whole victimology nonsense. So I'm going to say some numbers. They're going to be imprecise because I haven't done this in a while. But basically, they say that women earn, like, what, 82 cents of every dollar of a man. That's the number they usually Spout, is that correct? I, I might be 78 or 84. So anyway, so what, they, what they're not doing, though, is a couple things. They're not factoring in what did they study in college, how long have they been in the workforce, okay? How often have they asked their bo boss for a promotion or a raise, and what did they do in their late 20s? Okay, these are four things. So let's go through this. Women, because women are different than men, we agree, I hope, they're more likely to be nurturing, empathetic, compassionate, they gravitate more towards childhood education, more towards psychology. They study things that pay less, and they study have degrees that, by definition, are a lower pay scale. Men are more likely to study engineering, finance, business. Okay, so if women study the same thing as men, and if they enter into a field, and if in their late 20s, which, by the way, your late 20s, you'll learn this, 27 to 32 is the big exponent on your career, it's where all of a sudden you get the most promotions, the most responsibility, the kind of the, the biggest uptick. Most young women, for good reason, praise God, exit the workforce voluntarily to go have children. Okay? That removes them from a lot of promotions, a lot of raises, and things of that nature. Men keep on working through. And so it looks as if, wow, men are earning so much more than women. Now, do you know it's actually against the law to pay women less than men? It's against the law. What they're saying, though, is, well, look at this macro data. Hilariously... In 14 out of 15 of the top cities in America, women earn more than men in their late 20s. If you actually look at when women study the same thing as men, and they do not, they make the decision not to have children, and they stay in their career in their, to their early 30s, something I don't recommend. I actually think it creates really miserable women. They actually end up earning more than men. So it's just a, it's a flat-out lie. I'm happy to send you podcasts, articles, and research and data to support that. Um, but they can't have it both ways. And there are a lot of per, there, there are several professions, by the way, where women earn more than men. Nursing, for example, women earn more than men in nursing. It's the fact. No one ever talks about that. All right, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank All right, you. we'll do a couple more. Uh, hello, Charlie. Um, my name is Ricardo. I am a uh, Hispanic, me young Mexican American. Um, so I come from a family who are who are consists of radical Chicanos, mostly on my father's side. Um, and I feel like it's kind of been a, a challenge lately because I feel like with me kind of shifting, becoming more conservative lately, yeah, I've kind of like tried to just like, like it's been, it's been hard. It's been hard to try and like talk him and just make, I mean, I'm not trying to change his opinions or anything. I'm just trying to make him understand. So I just wanted to get some advice from you. Like, what do you think is the best way to help other, Chica other Mexican Americans or other young minorities like myself, like who are, in this same position, like, what, what do you think is the best way to help sure. them, like, maybe make them understand a little bit? So let, let me ask you a question, and it'll be a generalization. How many people in your community think that men can become pregnant? Um, 
I I haven't really got any insight on that, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think I don't. I would say maybe maybe some, maybe not, not all, but I think there yeah. would be some. I would guess it's <laughs> probably not a popular viewpoint in, in the Mexican American community. Mm-hmm. My point is that white woke liberalism mm-hmm. is incredibly incongruent mm-hmm. with Mexican American values. Big family, lots of children, life begins at conception. Not every, obviously, Hispanic Mexican family believes that, but that is a widely held belief. Or how about just traditional gender norms? Without diving too deep into it, Spanish is literally built on the conjugation of verbs based on gender, right? That's a good place to start. The most widespread, widespread pernicious, and popular movement in America is to believe Something along the lines of that men can become pregnant, women and men have no differences, and you could change your gender at will. You might not be able to convince Mexican Americans, or in your words, Chicanos, Mm -hmm. to believe in free market economics immediately. But I bet you can get them to believe that the 9, 10, 15, 20 generations that they could probably trace their lineage back to, everything that they've believed with gender norms is about to change if they embrace the American left. And they're all white, and they all hate them. That's how I would start. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, two more questions. Um, so with the uh, you know, 2020 election, you know, there's some people on some side that are saying you know, there was uh, truckloads of fake ballots, and then there's some that say there was as- absolutely no cheating. Where, where do you stand on that, and who, in your opinion, is the best – presidential candidate for 2024? It's, I, I've, I've never been asked that question before. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I get it all the time. Very informative. Very. So I look, I, I try not to dwell too much on this topic, but there, there, is, there are legitimate ballot harvesting operations across the country. I call them mules. It's been proven in a variety of different ways. That's what happens when you get universal vote by mail, and it happened definitely in Arizona. We know that happened in Georgia, happened in Pennsylvania. I think it happened again in this last election, by the way. Malice, ma- massive uh, manipulation of vote by mail and all that nonsense. Okay, so I'm happy to get into that. Um, I think that it's a mistake to mail everybody a ballot. I think it's a mistake to have universal voter registration. I think it's a mistake to have voting month. I'd love to get back to voting day, precinct by precinct voting. I think that you should vote in person if possible. I would love to restore all those different things. Unfortunately, everything I just articulated is losing awfully. Like in every state, it's becoming mass vote by mail, which I think opens the door in that way. Happy to go through the numbers with you and that. Um, to answer your second question about 2024, I've answered this quite some times. I'm going to back Donald Trump in 2024. It's my own personal endorsement, not on behalf of Turning Point USA. I know the president very well. I've known him for years. He's been very good to me, and I'm loyal. With that being said, I am an outspoken fan of Governor DeSantis. I think he's spectacular. Um, I think he's America's greatest governor. And I will say this, I did not like it when Donald Trump attacked DeSantis. I hope he stops that. I say that as a friend and as a supporter of Donald Trump. I don't think it actually helps him. I I think it hurts him. I think Ron DeSantis uh, has a chance to be a a once-in-a-generation political leader. I really do. But Donald Trump was the best president of my lifetime, and I'm a loyal person, and that's where I stand for 2024. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. This will be the last question. Sorry, guys, last question. So I had two questions. Is that okay? Let's do it. All right, I'll make it quick. So first one is a little bit of a more lighthearted one. So um, my partner, she's extremely religious. I'm not super religious myself. However, I've got a ring on my finger now, so I want to change that. Good. Um, so she got me a daily devotional I've been reading. We've been going to church um, and trying to d- dig into that because I do have a Christian background. What would you say are some day-to-day things I can help support her and be a more religious partner? That's a beautiful question. I just want to make a church recommendation. Go to Legacy Church here uh, locally. They're, they're terrific. So uh, I, think, I think you'll really be blessed by that. that that's a really important question uh, about how – I mean, I've actually never been asked that question. How can I be a better religious person? Wow. Um, partner, too. Yes, pray together. Um, the Bible is the greatest book ever written. It's actually a contemplation of books. I believe it is the Word of God, inerrant and endlessly helpful to humanity. And I, I, would, I would try to read the entire Bible in a year. My wife has a whole ministry that helps you do that called Bible in 365. If you really want to dive deep into it, I'm a big believer in fasting. I also believe that one of the great Christian failings of the last 
of this generation is not honoring the Sabbath. And so I would highly recommend honoring the Sabbath. I'm not saying that in a Christian context you are commanded. It is the only one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus did not explicitly repeat. In fact, he added some interesting nuance and context. However, God honored the Sabbath when he created the world. So that, that's, that's my best counter argument to that. I think it would actually bless you. I have a whole speech where I think actually honoring the Sabbath is the commandment that makes the other commandments possible. I think that if every human being honored the Sabbath, there would be less murder, less stealing, less infidelity, less cheating, less envy. I think the Sabbath calms your spirit and your soul down away from the materialistic, hyper crazy world. I'm a big believer in the Sabbath, so I'd recommend that. Um, and then I would, um, I would recommend just finding someone who takes their faith very seriously and asking a lot of questions and go to church together. And uh, you're going to grow deeply in your faith. I really believe that. You have a second question really quick? Yes. Uh, first off, thank you for that. That was a huge help. Um, second one, not as lighthearted. Okay. Um, over the last two years, we've seen an increase in militancy on either side of the, the political spectrum. Yeah, where we, we know. It, well, I mean, like, it used to be just, you know, you'd see these right-wing militias where it was like four-year-old fat dudes who were, like, LARPing in the woods. Yeah. And now it's <laughs> – well. I mean, seriously, now you're seeing guys like my age where it's like they're practicing small unit tactics, reading army field manuals, and the same is happening on the left where, you know, now you're seeing these Antifa flags on plate carriers and ARs. You saw it, um, one of those family-friendly drag shows. Uh, there were armed Antifa members outside. Pardon my pun. Do you feel like there's a turning point of no return where that militancy is – it's there, and there's no stepping back from it, yeah. even if it is just a simmer. No, that, that's a great question, and I think it actually ties a lot of our themes here. Why is that happening? It's happening because people can't blow off steam by speaking. That's why. When people can't speak, they go to the next thing, which is force. It's what happens. And so, I mean, look, you people doing small unit tactics and stuff. I mean, look, they feel as if they've been disenfranchised, suppressed, shut up, censored smeared, slandered. That's what I, I'm not speaking for. I don't know. I'm, I'm generalizing, right? But if I were to meet them, I guarantee they'd go up to the microphone. He said, why are you doing that? Well, this, 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 and this. And then how do they get treated by their government and get treated by everybody? They get called all the worst names in the world. Now, I, I want to just make reemphasize this. You have to stay peaceful. I am not a fan of going to force or conflict at all whatsoever. At the same time, I think it's important to add the context that if somebody's doing that, we should ask the question, why? Like, why is it that there's a growth of militias? Why? Now, CNN and the FBI, because of white supremacy. Okay, shut up. You're an idiot. Okay? Maybe it's because you're trying to always call them names and not allow them to talk, and then you kick them off Twitter and kick them off Facebook and kick them off Google, and then you take their kids and you want to put them on Lupron, and you hyper-radicalize them. Now, I'm not, I'm not justifying in any way violence or any of that. But I think it is a teaching moment, which is if you're going to keep on going the way we're going right now, you've just seen the beginning of radicalism. I don't want to go there, and I don't think you either. I think it's actually really concerning. How do you fix that speech? Leaders that listen to their voters. Like, actually, leaders are like, oh, wow, my voters want me to do this, so I'm going to do that. Therefore, they don't feel so disconnected from their government. Like not raiding Mar-a-Lago, like that would probably de-radicalize the country, Right. They're probably going to indict Donald Trump. Can't imagine that's going to be a way to simmer down tensions, right? Like, oh, yeah, let's go indict, indict Donald Trump. That's really going to calm down the temperature in the room. We'll do the opposite. They know that. And that's the final thing I'll say, which is a little bit controversial. I believe they want to stoke the flame of the militias. I think they actually want an excuse to go full Patriot Act, full anti saddam on us. Don't give them that excuse. Do not all of a sudden do something uncharacteristic, violent, forceful. Speech is all we have, guys. It goes from speaking to force. There is no middle ground. But I think that context is important instead of just preaching up here and acting as if, you know, every single one of those people that are doing that is happening because of white supremacy. Maybe it's because the regime has made it their goal to hate them. God bless you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate Defund it. the ATF. Thank you. All right. We'll, we'll, end, we'll end with this. So, guys, thank you again for being here tonight. I want to thank our amazing Turning Point USA chapter. You guys are terrific, honestly. Speech is the answer, and that's exactly what we did tonight. And let it be uh, told to all the collectivists and the authoritarians. They tried to shut up Turning Point twice, and the third time they failed miserably. 
and that's a big deal. God bless you guys. God bless this university, and thank you for all the help, the police, that made this happen. God bless you guys. Thank you.